Well, hey there folks, great to see you today. I'm just about to head up to the church, but there's just a few things that I wanted to tell you about first before I head on up. First of all, well, it's great to see you. The second thing is about the shoebox appeal. We mentioned last week that we were hoping to get together as many shoeboxes as we could to send off to Blythewood Care to go off to others less fortunate than ourselves for this Christmas. Well, we'll be opening up our church building towards the end of October and we'll let you know about that if you're in the church and you can get the shoebox to us and uh, we'll happily pass them on so they can go to others. Uh, that's one thing. Well, the second is uh, we're going to be reading a book together, uh, if you want to, that is, but it'd be great if you could do that with us. It's God on Mute by Pete Gregg. Now, that's the, the previous edition, the first edition, I think, that uh, I have in my bookshelves. But I've ordered and got the revised edition. It's been fully revised, but it also has a 40-day devotional with it, which is at the back of the book. And I hope we can read the book together and go through the 40-day devotional together as well, beginning quite soon. So you might want to get a hold of this book. It says in the back, a quote by Nicky Gumbel, God on Mute is a masterpiece. I cannot recommend it highly enough, it says. And there's also, also a note uh, from Pete Gregg that says, if you're hurting and secretly wondering where is God and why is this happening to me and how come my prayers aren't working, then I dedicate this book to you. Well, some of us did the prayer course together and then read books such as Red Moon Rising or Dirty Glory or How to Pray and things like that. Well, it'd be great if we could read this together as well. And if you've read it before, if you could join in with the devotional and it'd be good to do that. So that's that. Oh, and one last thing, Canopy, which is a Baptist Union online assembly, if you like, from the 23rd to the 25th of October. We're going to be joining in with that as well. So here's a short video about that just now. You can watch that while I get ready uh, to go up to church. Canopy is an opportunity to gather back together with God and with each other wherever it's possible. Canopy runs from Friday 23rd October to Sunday 25th October. It's free and available on YouTube. Canopy starts on Friday night with a prayer gathering and what better way to start than with praying to our God our Father. On Saturday morning we have two main sessions featuring times of worship, we're delighted to welcome guest speakers Ruth Rice and Brian Sanders to be with us. And we're going to hear lots of stories of hope and transformation of what God has been doing in and through our network of churches over the past six months. Then on Saturday afternoon, we have a selection of seminars on a variety of topics with input from Rebecca McLaughlin, Brian Sanders and Ruth Rice as well as input from people from within our family of churches again. And then on Sunday morning, we have an amazing opportunity to join together live for worship. Going live at 10.30, we have a full worship service with guest speaker, John Mark Comer. In Isaiah, we hear about God's people gathering together under the canopy of God's glory, not as individuals, but as a community of all ages. And so we want to encourage folk that as well as engaging and receiving content through the online content that we're producing, that you would also experience Canopy with other people. Now we know by the end of October, COVID restrictions may look very different to even what they do now. Maybe it will mean having to arrange a watch party on Facebook or arrange a Zoom call to watch with someone. Yeah, it's a much richer experience when we can share as family together, even if it's online. Or maybe you've had enough screen time and you'd rather find another way of engaging. Now you might not be able to engage in person with, with other people, but there are spaces to process what you learn. Close the laptop, switch the TV off and go out for a nice walk. Maybe we go with a friend, chat about what you've been learning. Hi Neil. So while you're having your walk, Canopy is not just for oldies like us. It's 
not just for adults, it's for all ages. It's really important to us. There's a full youth programme and a full all age programme for younger kids. Hey everyone, I hope you're well. Um, this morning's reading comes from Nehemiah chapter 8. Ezra reads the law. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which is made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. They bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is sacred to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of our Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for this is a sacred day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food and to celebrate with great joy, because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. And shall we Shall we now pray? Um, and I'll use some of the verses from chapter, chapter 9. Blessed be your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry host, the earth and all that is in them, the seas and everything that is in them. You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. O oh, Father, you are a great and mighty God. You are so much more wonderful and amazing than we can ever imagine or understand. You are so high above us and yet you sent Jesus into this world to draw us back to you, to show us what it means to to live for you and, and to follow you, Father. And so we thank you for all that you do in our lives, for the grace that we know each day, for the forgiveness of sins, for the adoption as sons and daughters into your family. That as a community of your followers, we can worship you where we are. Thank you, Father, for, for your spirit that lives within us. Your spirit that guides us. Your spirit that comforts us. Father, we thank you for, for the grace we know in our lives each day. Father, we're sorry for the times when we get things wrong. We thank you that you pick us up, that you encourage us to keep walking with you, Father. And so we give you thanks this morning for all the good things that you give us and for the grace that we know each day. For yours is the glory, yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, now and always. Amen. Well, recently we've been journeying through Nehemiah and we've got to the stage where Nehemiah and the people have built the walls, they've put the doors and the gates in place and folks have resettled in the city. There's peace and there's security and there's life again. It's, it's wonderful and it's just a picture of our restoration, our rebuilding 
in the Lord and the peace that we have of God within us, peace with God and the life we have uh, as well. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life in all its fullness. And so what Nehemiah and the people do next really does paint a wonderful picture for us uh, of our life with God and the blessings that we can know in him. What are the things that we see here? Well, we see people united together. There is real unity. Uh, there was a Greek uh, philosopher whose name I've written down in a post-it note somewhere, oh, Thucydides. Yet again, a dodgy pronunciation for this week, but I think that's how you pronounce his name. Anyway, what he said was, a city is not made up of walls or of ships. It's made up of people, and it's so true, isn't it? Here we have living stones being built together as a community of people here in Nehemiah, and it's an image that we have in the church as well. We're living stones with life within us all being built together as one. And there is real unity here. You can see that in Nehemiah. And in chapter 8, we're told that when the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord commanded for Israel. And we're told that there was an assembly there. All who were able to understand were there. All the people listened. And in verses 5 onwards, we're told that all the people could see him as he opened it. All the people stood up. All the people lifted their hands. There's a real unity there. It reminds me of Acts chapter 2, where the Spirit falls on the church. And we're told that when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter 2, towards the end of verses 42 and following, we get a beautiful cameo, a little insight into the early church with the Spirit fallen upon them. And we're told that everyone was filled with awe. All the believers were together. They had everything in common. They met together every day. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They enjoyed the favour of all the people and their number increased. And thinking about it in the Gospel of John, actually it was Jesus' prayer that would be united. He says, my prayer is not for them alone, speaking of uh, the first disciples there. As he prayed for all believers, he said, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. There was a real unity here, and there's an enormous blessing when people are together in unity. And I suppose it's a relational unity that's going on here. They were bound together just as in the church we are bound together in relationship in Christ as one body. And it's an interesting thought at the moment because we're not able to all gather together as one in the numbers that we usually enjoyed on a Sunday morning. That's not possible for us right now. But I suppose thinking about it, what would you rather have? Would you rather all be together in the one building and not have good relationships as one? Or would you rather have good relationships as one and yet not be able to be in the same building. I wonder what you would choose just now. Well, I know what I would choose. Actually, you know what I would really choose? It's a totally different choice altogether that at least some of us might be able to come together some of the time and joining with everyone online and certainly relationally too. But that's a thought uh, for another day. Here, all the people are together, relationally together. They were bound together as one in the Lord and he knew great blessings from that. And we're told at one point as they're reading the law, they discover that the Lord had commanded through Moses that the Israelites were to live in booths during the feast of the seventh month. This is a month that they're in, we're told at the beginning of chapter 8, and that they should proclaim this word and spread it throughout their towns and in Jerusalem, go out into the hill country and bring back branches from olive and wild olive trees and from myrtles, palms and shade trees to make booths as it's written. So the people went out and brought back branches and built themselves booths on their own roofs in their courtyards in the courts of the house of God 
and in the square by the water gate, and the one by the gate of Ephraim, the whole company that had returned from exile built booths and lived in them. From the days of Joshua, son of Nun, until that day the Israelites had not celebrated it like this, and their joy was very great. They knew the joy of doing this together in worship. They were worshipping together in unity, and they knew great uh, joy. There's such a blessing from unity in the Lord. I've got a bookmark, which is actually in Psalm 133 in my Bible. I don't know if you can see that. Is it in focus? From 1 John 3.11, we should love one another. But it's actually in Psalm 133, which says this, how good and pleasant it is when brothers, and we'll say brothers and sisters, live together in unity. It's like the precious oil poured on the head, running down in the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robes, it's as if the Jew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. The people here knew life, the new blessing, like the Jew falling on Mount Zion where they were. Well, we know a great blessing from our relationships as well, but relationships take work. The people here had to work at it. They were out uh, gathering things together so they could assemble together in booths. Well, our relationships take work too, don't they? Keeping in touch with each other making the effort, maintaining those good relationships and being thankful for them all the time. I wonder who you're thankful for. Well, today is a day when we can pause and thank God for the wonderful relationships that we have around us and know how good and pleasant it is when we're in unity. Thanking God for the blessing that they are to us and reflecting on how we can be a blessing to others around us even today. Well, the folks here were building a foundation for this city and they were building it on unity, being one in the Lord, and they were also building it on worship and a real desire in their heart to know the Lord as well. And so they had the word of God open as uh, they worshipped. We're told Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. They had open hearts towards an open Bible. Loads of folks have Bibles. Quite a lot of them remain closed Bibles or on shelves. They're precious to us. These Bibles sometimes are passed down from family member to family member, or we got them at a special time in our life, but they're quite often closed and kept closed. Our Bibles are to be opened up regularly as our heart is towards it. Uh, there was one theologian who said it's a bit like having a suit of armour available as a warrior, but just leaving the suit of armour somewhere on a shelf for it to rust away and never be used. Well, our Bible is to be opened up regularly. And here they're reading it at the water gate. That's one of the gates that was mentioned before when they were building the walls and putting the gates in place. And the water gate is important. In fact, the water is such an important image in the Bible, an image of real blessing and of the Spirit flowing towards us. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. In fact, the very first Psalm mentions water, doesn't it? Blessed is the one who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Well, here the people are, and they've got this real hunger to know God's word in their life. They're asking themselves, what does it mean? What does God's word mean for me? What does it mean for us as a community? What does it mean for the world round about us, we, we read in verse 8, they read from the book of the law, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. The people had a real hunger in their hearts. This wasn't hurried, it wasn't half-hearted, it wasn't mechanical or anything like that. This was a deep desire to know what God's word was for them. And so we're told in Verse 3, that when Ezra, Ezra, in fact, in verse 1, we're, we're told that they told Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law. This was so much of a desire to hear it. And then in verse 3, he read it aloud 
from daybreak till noon. So he read it aloud from day, daybreak until noon. Imagine that length of time listening uh, to the word being read and all the people were told listened attentively to the book of the law uh, throughout that time. This was their desire. And as Ezra opened the book, we were told in verse 5, all the people could see him. And as he opened it, they all stood up. They had this reverential uh, attitude towards what was being done. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God. And all the people lifted their hands and they responded with their voices. A wise man once quoted Strauss, who said that the human voice is the most beautiful instrument of all in the world, but the most difficult to play and get right. Well, here the people are using their voices well and they're responding with amen, amen. Yes, let it be so, I suppose we could say. And then they bow down in worship with their faces to the ground. So they're standing up, they're lifting their hands, they're responding with their voices, they're bowing down, they have their faces to the ground. I wonder when the last time was you worshipped like that. It involved the whole self, mind, heart, body, soul. This is an experiential, reverential, wholehearted attitude towards God that gives our all for him. This is what worship is all about. This is what the people are building their city on. They're building it on worship and a desire to know God in their life. Oh, that we would have that same desire deeply planted in our own heart and in the life of our community as well. So the people here are bound together as one in unity of heart and of purpose. They have a desire to know God in their life and to do that together in community. They're worshipping before him as one. And they have the word of God open. Sometimes the word of God is a bit like a window and we can look through that window and see the world as God sees the world and get a right perspective on things, not just our own opinions or ideas or our own spectacles. We all, I suppose, wear a pair of spectacles when we look at things. Well, the Word of God is like a window through which we can see things. So it says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is God's perspective of things and the Word of God allows us to see the world with that uh, perspective. It's, it's like a window for us. Well, sometimes it's also a bit like a painting and the Word of God paints a picture for us of who God is like, what God is like. And as we read God's Word, we can gaze upon his beauty and the wonder of God as well with this beautiful painting that's portrayed for us. So for example, in John chapter 14, Thomas says to Jesus, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have, I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So we look upon Jesus and we see a picture being painted of our Heavenly Father, a God of love and grace and compassion and salvation who welcomes everyone, and that includes you as well. So the Word of God's like a window through which we see things properly with God's perspective also a painting, but it's also a mirror as well. And when we read the Word of God, we see a reflection of ourselves and how we really are too. It's as if we see our own faces reflected in, in the mirror. I don't know if maybe one morning, uh, I'm not suggesting you have, but maybe one morning you've got up and you've caught a look of yourself in the mirror before you have washed or shaved or put on your makeup and you've caught a sight of yourself as to how you really are. Well, sometimes the Word of God helps us to do that, and it helps us to see ourselves as we really are. And the people here, as they hear the Word of God being explained to them and being read to them, all of a sudden they begin to see things in themselves that need to change. They see themselves for how they really are. So in chapter 9, 
We're told that the Israelites gathered together, fasting and wearing sackcloth and having dust on their heads. Uh, we're told that they stood in their places and confessed their sins and the wickedness of their fathers. And they spent time confessing. They were lamenting. They were repenting. They were realizing what had to change. I wonder if you were to look in the mirror, not really in a mirror, but in God's word and see yourself being reflected back. I wonder what might need to change in you. Well, the Word of God helps us to do that. But as the people do that, actually, they also see this beautiful painting, this beautiful picture as well of God and his grace. And so they begin to pray. We're told that the Levites said, stand up and praise the Lord your God, who's from everlasting to everlasting. They weren't to remain in that place. Uh, of just confessing and repenting and lamenting. It's a good place to be sometimes, but there's more than that. So much more, there's God's grace in response and his forgiveness and his acceptance and another chance to get right with him. They began by saying, Blessed be your glorious name and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens and all their starry host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. And then they began to speak about their history as a people. They talked about Abraham, and he said, You have kept your promise because you are righteous. See, they talked about the suffering in Egypt. And he said, But by day you led them with a pillar of cloud and fire as they went through the wilderness, and by night with a pillar of fire to, to give them light on the way they were to take. He talked about how they were disobedient. Uh, but they said, but you are a forgiving God, you're gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. You provided for their every need with this pillar of cloud and fire and the bread and the water. They lacked nothing, their clothes did not wear out, nor did their feet become swollen. Yet when they, when they went into the promised land again, they lost the, their way. But they said, but when they were oppressed, they cried out to you from heaven, you heard them. And in your great compassion, you gave them deliverance. You, you rescued them. This is the grace of God in response to our sin. And this is this beautiful picture we have painted in the Bible. We're, we're told in 2 Corinthians 5 that is, if anyone is a, in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. God made him who had no sin to be a sin offering for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It's as if we look in the mirror and in place of all of our sin, all of our waywardness, it's as if it's all wiped away by God. And in its place is the beautiful righteousness of Jesus, this great exchange that, that takes place. In Zechariah chapter 3, we have an image of Joshua, and the angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. And he said to Joshua, see, I have taken away your sin, and I will put rich garments on you. So he put a clean turban on his head and he closed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. This is the righteousness of Jesus that we have. I wonder if you've known that great exchange in your life and the joy that comes from it. The people here, as they worshipped God and as they reflected on who he was, in the midst of all of this time of feasting and celebration, they realized, as Nehemiah said to them, do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And the word he used for strength there, it's no mistake. It means a stronghold, a strong place, a fortress, a walled city, even we could think. And think of what they've just been through, what they've just done. Went to, play, went to place their trust in the physical walls around them with the gates. It was the Lord, of course. It is the joy of the Lord is your strength. And when the Lord is your hiding place, your refuge when you know him in your life. His joy is yours and his strength is yours as well. Well, may the joy of the Lord be your strength. And as you know that joy and that strength in your life, may you know great peace and great blessing from the Lord today and forevermore. 
God bless you and see you soon.